I'm uh, very pleased to um, have with us today Professor Marie Abe, who is Associate Professor of Music, Musicology, and Ethnomusicology at uh, Boston University. Um, so Professor Abe um, works on, uh, is also affiliated faculty at the African Studies Center um, and the American and New England S uh, Studies Program at Boston University. Um, she took her BA degree at Swarthmore College and did her MA and PhD in ethnomusicology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I was excited to invite Professor Abe here is just given, uh, I really appreciate the breadth of her scholarship, um, the real kind of sense of, I mean, the fact that she's a great writer, but also the fact that she's really attentive, not just to music um, and formal qualities, but also um, there's a kind of vulnerability in the work uh, around kind of uh, really immersing herself in these different kind of cultural traditions. And the fact that she's both kind of conceptually savvy and also really, I think, uh, willing to um, pay attention to people and their stories and involve those is something I found really compelling. So along these lines, um, she's also, uh, she's published recently a book, uh, Resonances of Chindonya, from which she'll be giving her talk today. Um, and this is an ethnographic exploration of the politics of space and sound, affect, and Japanese popular performing arts. Um, she also is interested uh, in cultural advocacy, ritual music in Bali and Thailand, uh, the accordion and immigrant communities in California, anti-nuclear movement um, and music in Japan, anti-US military movement and music in Okinawa, and Afrofuturism in the United States. So an incredibly wide range of interests. She's a recipient of a faculty fellowship um, at Wellesley College uh, and has also been a fellow at the Reischauer Institute um, for Japanese Studies uh, at Kyoto, I mean um, at, at Harvard University. Um, she's also interested in public anthro ethnomusicology and has co-produced the NPR radio documentary Squeezebox Stories, which tells stories from Californian um, immigrant immigration history using the accordion as a common trope. And she's also a um, pretty great performer on accordion um, as well. She's an active performer and improviser on the accordion and piano um, and is hitting the um, festival circuit as well. She performs um, with the Boston-based uh, Ethiopian Groove Collective called Debo Band. Um, it's been featured in the New York Times, Rolling Stone Magazine, and on NPR. Uh, she also teaches a range of uh, courses that I wish I could take, such as music and violence, sound, music, and ecology, and Japan and the ethnographic gaze. And she's currently working on field work on 1950s Japanese popular music in Ethiopia during the Korean War. So I think that helps to give you a sense of the kind of transnational range of her work um, and the fact that she's also trying to take, I think in a way that we could probably learn a lot from her personal interests and skills as a performer and um, having that infuse her, her scholarly work in a way that I find pretty inspiring. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, please welcome uh, Professor Mari Abe, who will be talking to us today about how it, how it to be overheard, resonances of Chindonya in contemporary Japan. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone on? Awesome. Well, thank you, Professor Jackson, for the super generous uh, introduction. Um, and thank you for also the invitation. Thank you, CGS Admission, um, for having me. Um, and also thank you to Barbara for organizing all the complicated logistics of coming here via Japan, from Boston via Japan. <laughs> so I really appreciate all her help. Um, so today, um, my talk will be uh, taken from the book, which examines the intersections of sound, space, and sociality in contemporary Japan through an ethnographic analysis of chindonya, which is a fairly unique uh, street advertisement practice in Japan. Um, how many of you know what it is? Ooh. This is the, the highest percentage <laughs> in the audience. This, is, this speaks so highly. Uh, to the, the rich um, knowledge embodied by the community of CGS here. Um, but in case you don't, um, I will be talking about it um, shortly. And in a nut nutshell, my book is about the aesthetic, economic, and political work of Chindonya as a historical, which is a historical performance art, itiner itinerant performance art, which gains a, gained a new relevance as a sonorous form of affective labor in contemporary Japan. So affective labor means sonorous form of labor that turns um, social relations into value, right? And, and, um, and I'm interested in what that work is doing in the time of neoliberal precarity and nuclear anxiety in contemporary Japan. And 
before um, delving right into the contents of my talk, I wanted to situate my work a little bit, my book a little bit dis disciplinarily, and then also in Japan studies, um, so that you have a sense of sort of who I'm trying to, to engage with through my work. So I'm trained as an ethnomusicologist and also in cultural anthropology, uh, but really um, my, um, broadly speaking, I wrote this book as a bu uh, sort of a bridge between cultural geography and sound studies. Um, and I won't really get into defining those. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it um, during Q&A. But in response to the emerging critiques of the Eurocentric assumptions behind the conceptions of space and also conceptions of sound in both fields in the recent decade, I posit that listening to Chindonya offers an alternative. So I try to bring together theories of social production of space in cultural ge uh, geography and this concept of acoustemology in sound studies. Um, in my book, I um, put forward the, a trope of hibiki, which is an, an analytic that I sort of instilled from my ethnographic observations of Chindonya. Um, I, I know this is sort of a jargony things, but I, in case somebody's interested, these are sort of um, the disciplinary conversations I'm trying to engage within. And so I put forward this keyword hibiki, which will be the center of my talk today, um, which means resonance, right, in Japanese, to attend to the vernacular ontologies of spatiality and local forms of audition in Japan, thereby troubling uh, what White, White Ehrman, uh, in Veit Ormond's words, the binary of the materiality of things and the immateriality of signs that has been at the center of Western thought for much of the modern era. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that these sort of sensory binaries uh, can be challenged by listening carefully and creatively to Chindonya or the way Chindonya listens to sounds. So it's in the spirit of taking sound and ethnography seriously in conceptualizing the social production of space that I wrote my work. Um, but in addition, uh, within Japan studies, um, first, this is the, Chindonya really hasn't been paid much attention to. So this is, this happens to be the first monograph of Chindonya. But in, in addition to that, there are sort of two areas or three areas where I'm hoping to add to the conversations uh, where I saw a little bit of a um, need for more deeper ethnographic engagement. So one is the, the area of Taishu Geino. And this is such a tricky word to, to translate. So Taishu, the popular, the popular mass, vernacular, Geino is performing arts. But whenever, whenever you translate it into English words, the, what, what it really uh, embodies and it references sort of gets lost. Um, and while most studies of Japanese music in English language focus on the contemporary pop music or self-cultural pop genres or traditional and nationalized forms, art forms such as kabuki <coughs> or shamisen, taishu geino, a contemporary sort of vernacular performing arts, uh, are far and few in between. But I think there is actually a lot to be said by looking at them um, as a contemporary practice. And the second area is the debates around what anthropologist Anna Allison calls social precarity in post-bubble Japanese society. While the social repercussions of the economic crisis have been discussed and theorized in article-length studies, not many monograph-length studies examine how social fragmentations are experienced and negotiated in everyday life um, in Japan today and in post-industrial societies at large. Um, and lastly, arts in Osaka don't really get much attention um, in monograph length studies in ethnomusicology. So these are sort of areas where I'm hoping to add a little bit to. And so I wanted to give you uh, an overall uh, architecture of my book so you understand where my talk today will fit into. Um, so the, um, I divided my work into, broadly speaking, two. So the first three chapters are about Chindonya as an orthodox practice, as a, as a publicity practice. And then the last two, three, four chapters are about the politicization of Chindonya. And that's actually how I got into this, prog um, this um, project in the first place. So the first two are very deeply historical um, through ethnographic analysis. So the first chapter uh, focuses on Chindonya's attention to walking and gesture as a creative imaginative historicizing practice. 
Um, and uh, this chapter talks about the entangled histories of Western imperialism, Japanese colonialism, and Japan's shift in relationship to different modes of market economy that informed Chindonya's history. And I draw a parallel between their genealogical performances and uh, kogengaku, or modernology of 1930s, and street observation study of the 80s. Uh, to talk about how their footwork embodies larger historical rhythms of the city, cycles of capital accumulation, urban development, and earthquakes. And then the second chapter talks about um, using ethno what I call ethnographic fairy tales, uh, focus on pre-modern history of uh, marginalized caste-based difference of itinerant performance, um, and also pervasive association of Chindonya with nostalgia. And I talk about how um, their enticement is not simply longing for an irretrievable past, but rather it's for temporality that lies outside of capitalist time. Um, and they do this by embodying multiple historicities. And then chapter three is the most sort of uh, juiciest ethnographic chapter that talks about the everyday routines and tactics of Chindonya performers, which will be um, coming up in a, a minute. And then chapter four uh, talks about uh, musical offshoots of Chindonya. So it's not just Chindonya. Um, Chindonya aesthetics has been picked up by various musicians and activists, especially since uh, 1995 Hanshin earthquake. Um, and I talk about how class-based social difference and otherness um, that I reference in chapter two have been mobilized uh, to address contemporary uh, problems and raise a multicultural question of Japan. And then the last chapter sort of zone in on a case study of politicization of Chindonya, and then I talk about um, how Chindonya, um, pivoting around silence, um, how Chindonya in the aftermath of uh, the nuclear disaster um, became politicized as an anti-nuclear power movement, uh, sort of mascot almost. Um, uh, despite the silence of mourning that was enforced after, after the disaster. So that is sort of the larger um, arc of my argument. Um, so now I will bring you right into chapter three material. So let me introduce you to Chindonya finally. So Chindonya refers to groups of street musicians in Japan who are hired to advertise an employer's business. Typically, the employer negotiates a deal with a trope, usually at about a trope troupe, usually at about 250 uh, US dollars per performer uh, for the day, who will parade through the streets, not to sell products themselves, but to draw customers to an establishment by playing an assortment of instruments, including Japanese percussions and horn instruments, often clarinet, trumpet, or saxophone. So uh, chindon is actually an onomatopoeia. So chin comes from the gong chime or kame, and then don comes from this uh, odo or the taiko here. The employer varies daily and can be anything from a local supermarket to pachinko slot machine parlor. Publicizing opening sales or a special discount on a particular product, such as cell phone plans or even happy hour at a chain bar. There's no singing or playing jingles. Usually, the leader of the group delivers advertising speeches between tunes, while others hand out flyers to the passers-by and chat with them about whatever client they, they happen to be advertising that day. So I will, um, and this is sort of the kinds of interactions that happen on their daily routine. Um, so I would play a video just to give you a sense of the sound. <laughs> Once a ubiquitous part of everyday urban soundscape in the 1950s, now Chindonya is largely considered anachronistic, obsolete, and uncool. So it's been about six, uh, 15 years since I first started digging into this practice. During those years, I spent the majority of my time in Japan with Chindon Tsushinsha, based in Osaka. This particular troupe is now widely respected by many Chindon practitioners in Japan for their great financial success, a high level of performance, and the largest size troupe consistent of, uh, consisting of 26 full-time members who make their li livelihood, who earn their livelihood through Chindon practices. Three years ago? Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
still here. They're still kicking <laughs> strong. Yep. Uh, so that's that's the ethno, uh, ethnographic fairy tales. There are so many uh, stories of Chindonya that are told like pipe, Pied Piper of Hamelin, right? Sort of entice children following. Um, so the Chindonya practitioners themselves are both philosophers and ethnographers. Their philosophies of sound, um, streets, and affect were cultivated through their everyday routines of walking, listening, and sounding throughout the city. In so doing, they engage with locals, listen to their stories, supplement their knowledge with archival materials, and perform their uh, knowledge publicly through sounding, walking, speaking, and writing things down. At the end of the day's work, I, I would often go out drinking with members of Qingdong Sushinsha. As our tongues loosened after a few drinks, conversations would often turn to their observations from the day. They would share astute observations about the rhythm, rhythms of the city and people's routines, analyze their social and economic conditions that inflict the everyday lives of the working class residents they encountered, note how sounds e echo differently in different parts of the city or different times of history or how the weather affected the timbre of their instruments, share existential mu musings on life and urban solitude, and indulge in speculative historical revisioning of this obsolete form of street performance that they practice. Much of my theoretical framework is distilled from these acoustic philosophies and ethnographic insights that Chindonya pr practitioners shared with me. So when um, Chindonya has often been butt of many jokes, it's often uh, sometimes stigmatized um, for, its, for it being sort of out of place or out of time. My parents to this day uh, make fun of me for getting a PhD in Chindonya because of that association. Um, so many people, especially in Chindonya, they ask like, why did you decide to study Chindonya? Why does it matter? So let me talk about that a little bit first. At once a musical practice, a commercial activity, and mere background noise in everyday life, Chindonya is underpinned by three key areas of ambiguity which render the practice uncategorizable uh, under the contentious labels of the traditional folk modern, art, commerce, and noise and music. So the first is that sort of sense of difference that I referenced earlier, being out of time, out of place. Uh, that's interesting to me. What sort of difference are they embodying? But the, the, uh, the next one, the first, the sound of Chindonya, an amalgam of Japanese and European musical elements, highlight the inherent contradictions between the assertions of, assertions of Japanese uniqueness and Japan's claim to westernize modern nationhood. Deemed too modern to be traditional, but too anachronistic, anachronistic to be modern today, Chindonya is caught in the, the Mubia strip of Japan's claim to be uh, to unique national cultural homogeneity and its recursive relationship with its constitutive outside the West. The second area of tension is the popular perception of Chindonya uh, uh, stems from the ambiguity of its sonic presence. Throughout its history, Chindonya has had tenuous relationships with the categories of music, noise, and sound. Neither music or noise, and never having been canonized, documented, or commodified, Chindonya was a sound that was hardly listened to. It does not necessarily, necessarily depend on having a conventional audience. It's simply overheard amidst other urban sounds. And the third area of tension lies in the ineluctable connection with commerce. Chindonya is first and foremost considered a business rather than a musical genre. Performers perceive themselves to be firmly positioned outside of the music industry. Chindonya troops are not selling their music per se, but are using musical sounds in the commercial interest of their clients' businesses. In this way, they're looked down upon by the street vendors and street performers, right? They're not selling their skills or product. And yet, perhaps because of these um, ambiguities, Chindonya has been a form of affective labor that has flexibly adapted to and resiliently persisted through Japan's different capitalisms in the 20th and 21st centuries. Chindonya's forefathers' first appearance coincided with the weakening of the semi-feudal economic system and the rise of a vibrant merchant money economy that paved the way towards the capitalist modernity of the 20th century. Chindonya's peaks came at the heights of industrial economy in the 19-teens, 30s, and the 50s. And the most recent resurgence has happened within the context of the new capitalism geared towards service and information, flexible labor, and neoliberal policies. 
So it's these layers of elusiveness of Chindonya as sound that resists these discursive categories and its historical resilience and continuity that compel me to study it. Um, so that's not the kind of answer I give to my parents' friends, but that's the answer I give you. <laughs> Um, so I begin with an ethnographic anecdote to introduce key questions uh, for today's talk by detour of history. We're in central Osaka in an indoor entertainment theme park called Paradise Shopping Street, Gokurak Shotengai, that styled itself after an outdoor shopping arcade from the 1920s and 30s. In one of the faux shops are three brightly costumed performers standing in front of young and curious domestic tourists. The leader of the troupe, Hayashi Kojiro, began a performance introducing themselves with a melodious and eloquent speech. So that's him on the left. He said, we're Chindonya, a ludicrous roadside advertisement business with musical instruments. We've been in this form since the Meiji period, letting grow Shiseido, Lion, and Asahi beer to what they are today. But we've remained, as we were, quite modest. Speaking on behalf of Chindonya as a whole in his speech, Hayashi took credit for nurturing few of the largest corporate companies that have expanded globally in the past hundred years. Although a bit of an exaggeration, his speech highlights how Chindonya is situated at the root of the development of cap uh, Japan's capitalist modernity. The origin of Chindonya is often traced to the first historical record of a proxy sonic advertisement. When a town's uh, person named uh, Amekatsu, this one is the uh, second one after him, uh, uh, this is Tamba Kurimaru, advertised for a candy store in 1845 using bells and wood blocks. Soon more musical instruments were incorporated, both Japanese instruments and um, European brass instruments, which had just been introduced to Japan in the late 1800s. <coughs> By the early 1900s, the musical advertisement parades were an awe-inspiring spectacle on the streets symbolizing forces of modernization and westernization that swept across the country. During Chindonya's golden era in the 1930s and 1950s, there were estimated 2,500 Chindonya performers throughout the country, and they became a familiar and a ubiquitous sight and sound in uh, popular everyday life. By this time, Chindonya became synonymous with the everyday soundscape, the notion of Taishu, the popular masses, and the dynamic sociality that characterized small neighborhood streets. After the 1960s, as other forms of advertisement became mainstream, Chindonya was in sharp decline. It became the butt of many jokes, evoking nostalgia for some, intrigue or nuisance for others, and, and indifference at best. Due to the forces of capital accumulation that propelled its economy, the Japanese urban landscape has shifted drastically in the past several decades, changing the conditions in which Ch uh, Chindonya did their business. The layouts of the neighborhoods were reorganized, small back streets disappeared, architecture cha changed from wooden one-story plebeian houses to concrete high-risers, small business became, businesses became corporatized, urban sonic environment saturated. These changes in turn brought shift in the sense of sociality on the streets and the uh, cultural understanding of public space. One photographer who captured Chindonya on various small streets laments the dissolution of sociality as back streets and Chindonya disappeared. Quote, back street is a story of human sentiments. Back street is my favorite place that smells of people's everyday life. However, at the peak of the bubble economy, back street was erased and wooden houses turned into apartments. There, the everyday life of warmth no longer exists, end quote. The sense of social fragmentation deepened further through the long economic downturn in the following decades. As the neoliberal policies widened socioeconomic gaps on an unprecedented level, the national anxiety around social precarity produced a prevalent discourse that folded social alienation into spatial alienation, cementing the popular conception of the streets as transparent and anonymous. In such narratives, Chindonya simply becomes nostalgia, indexing the disappearing popular mass on the verge of vanishing together with the romanticized notion of the dynamic sociality that once existed in small back streets. However, Chindonya hasn't disappeared and isn't simply the residue of the past. In fact, after decades of inac inactivity, Chindonya has been undergoing a resurgence since the, 19, uh, the late 1980s. Despite being labeled as anachronistic and ob obscure, um, some Chindonya troops today have achieved financial success, generating up to $1 million in annual income, while Chindonya aesthetics has been taken up by 
rock, jazz, and experimental musicians. Um, and we fashioned into hybridized musical practices. So it's the, that's me on the accordion right there. In recent years, this erstwhile commercial practice has been turned into a sonic emblem of anti-nuclear movement, um, anti-nuclear power movement through an unexpected turn of events ever since the earthquake tsunami nuclear disaster of 311 in 2011. So the bigger questions are, what makes Jindonya viable and sustainable as both an aesthetic and economic practice today, when the initial conditions in which it developed no longer hold true in contemporary Japan? When the neighborhood streets have disappeared and the notion of Taishu, the popular mass, has disintegrated, what kinds of understanding of public space, sociality, and listening public emerge from listening to Chindonya as their sounds resonate in the midst of shifting geographies of urban modernity? Extending anthropologist Stephen Feld's call to, quote, imagine auditory culture as historical formations of distinct sensibilities and as sonic geographies of difference, end quote. I suggest that Chindonya sounds compel us to challenge the linear narrative that equates the development of a neoliberal capitalist economy to the abstraction of urban landscape and the dissolution of sociality. So to begin to explore these questions, I will first introduce a concept that guides my analysis, hibiki. So it might be a little hard to read and you don't need to read all of it I highlighted. Um, Whenever my uh, interlocutors mentioned words and concepts that um, referenced hibiki or related words, I sort of uh, highlight them in yellow. It was very frequent. So as you can see in these quotes, resonance was the central recurring trope I heard in, in conversations about the oral sensibilities that inform deeply social, relational, and affective principles of Chindonya's commercial work. Over the course of my field work, Chindonya performers repeatedly emphasize the need to sound their instruments in a way that resonates with listeners' hearts, kokoro ni hibiku. Uh, to distill the insights of Chindonya practitioners, I postulate hibiki as a simultaneously acoustic and affective work of sounding that articulates latent sociality, the acoustic environment, and sedimented histories. Put another way, hibiki is a dynamic and indeterminate articulation of sound, space, time, and sociality. It's a way to think these things together. Hibiki is a sound space that physically and imag imaginatively interrelate listeners and performers. Hibiki is where the public space is sonically produced, both in material, acoustic space, and imagined discursive space. Hibiki has a temporal aspect as well, Resonance lingers, allowing the practitioners to tune into the previous relations and histories that informed the site of performance at a given place and time. Hibiki is an inherently relational and contingent process in which space is produced socially, affectively, and acoustically. Through the analytical trope of, trope of Hibiki, I simultaneously examine the materiality of sound and the analytical force of sound and silence as a social metaphor. As I mentioned earlier, chindonya is first and foremost considered a business rather than a musical genre of performing arts. One of the chindonya musicians I worked with, Kobayashi Shinnosuke, the clarinet uh, player, defined chindonya as a sound business rather than music business. As such, they perceive themselves to be firmly positioned outside the music industry. Chindonya troops are not selling their music per se, as I mentioned earlier, but they're using musical sounds in the commercial interest of their client's business. And to conduct this business soundly, according to Kobayashi, Chindonya needs to be carefully balanced in their twin goal. Chindonya has two aspects to, uh, quote, Chindonya has two aspects, to bring joy and pleasure to people we've, ne we've never met before and to publicize the client's business, end quote. On one of my last days of uh, fieldwork observing how they conduct this twin goal business, I sat down at a cafe with Hayashi for a last farewell chat. After having spent two years with his troupe on an almost daily basis, I decided it was time to ask him a rather big question. What does he consider to be the most important value in being a chindonya? Without hesitation, he answered, definitely the ability to imagine, to imagine the state of mind of people inside their heart, of people in front of us, of people inside their houses, or perhaps I might somehow intuitively feel them even though they may not even exist. Reading the mind, reading the air, or kuki o yomu, atmosphere, imagining the listener's emotional state. 
These were recurrent phrases in the conversations I had with Shindonia practitioners throughout my field work. I was struck by how profoundly these entrepreneurial street performers cared about the sentiments of those their sounds reached. Now, not only the passers-by on the street, but also shop owners, office workers indoors, and invisible inhabitants behind the walls in the residential areas they passed through. To be effective in their business meant cultivating sensitivities to be able to imagine who might be listening, caring about what the listener's sentiments might be, instilling joyous spirit in them through music, forging interpersonal connections with and among the audience, and navigating the urban public space accordingly. In other words, the production of interpersonal relationships is at the heart of Chindonya's musical advertisement practice. This discourse and practice of caring about and imagining listeners' sentiments, or what I called uh, imaginative empathy, informs the production of both affective and acoustic resonance, or hibiki. For the Chindonya practitioners to feel that they had a successful performance, their play must create sound that resounds in and resonates with the listeners. Much like the acoustic phenomenon in which a particular frequency activates a dormant object, which in turn produces sympathetic vibrations, Chindonya's performance is intended to move listeners through sound, inviting the listeners into unexpected social encounters on the street. In the sound business of Chindonya, in which it, the interper interpersonal relations are at the heart of its enterprise, these imaginative works of affective resonance are as tangible and consequential as the production of acoustic resonance itself. And um, so I called uh, imaginative empathy as sozo kyokan, which was a word that they kind of made up in, my com uh, in a conversation with me. They also used kyome, so I'm sort of bracketing some of the Japanese words um, as imagi imagin imaginative empathy. And when, um, when I'm referencing to hibiki as resonance, uh, these are some of the, the words that they used. So kyome again, or hibiki, or zankyo, which is sort of lingering resonance, or kyoshin, which is a, a sort of a sympathetic vibration. Um, and I also want to return to the previous comment by Hayashi about listeners who might not even dare. Um, um, and that was, uh, to me, a little creepy at the time. But uh, later on, when I was thinking through their work, uh, the, how Chindonya became politicized in, um, in the anti-nuclear power movement, uh, this sort of way of thinking about uh, playing for people who have passed um, became a pivot point um, because they were playing for the victims and possible imminent death from nuclear radiation. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that um, in Q&A. So how do they effectively produce hibiki, affective and acoustic resonances on the street? Now I want to talk about how members of Chindon Tsushinsha negotiate the geographical and affective dynamics that inform the physical street, space of the street. It's no simple task for Chindonya to navigate the urban streets. One troop member, Kawaguchi Masaki, spoke of how seemingly wide enough shopping arcade streets like this are in fact filled with informal and complex territorial lines, leaving very, very, very little space available for them to walk through. The unspoken rule, according to him, is that in front of each shop, there's a one meter radius semicircle that is felt to be the shop's territory. Although legally a public road, overstepping such territorial boundaries would upset the shop owners, therefore hindering the relationship between them and Chindonya's employer, as well as between the Chindonya and those shops who may be their potential clients in the future. So now I will uh, show you a video of them uh, walking through one of these shopping arcades. <laughs> So you see that they are pretty much sticking to the middle of the road. They don't really zigzag around. Um, you also see that uh, the effect of the sound happens. There's a little delay. People kind of turn back a little bit instead of going right to them. Um, you also might have uh, seen the trumpet player bowing to the shop clerk. So 
so I asked him what that was about, and he said that um, that he meant uh, sorry for making a ruckus, you know, sorry to bother you. We're going to be passing by really fast, but if you like us, please hire us, and I'll be happy to come back. <laughs> that was that was what was um, conveyed in that bow. So such uh, uh, sensitivity to spatial dynamics is evident in the practitioner's constant scanning of the surroundings. While walking, they not only look to um, their immediate surroundings, but also at a distance, above and behind. The 10th floor verandas of a huge apartment complex, the glass window two floors above the street level where people look, uh, look their, poke their heads down, out and look down, or storefront 30 meters behind where they have passed, where their sales pitch sparked conversations among passersby. It's necessary for them to assess who their sounds are reaching, how their presence and sounds may be affecting the listeners, and how they might create relations with listeners by walking over to them to talk or to make eye contact and wave. So um, I, will make, uh, I will show you another video um, in a very quiet residential area in the afternoon where I didn't see anyone on the street for a while, but they kept playing and I was wondering, like, why do they keep doing this? And this happened. <laughs> so that actually happened a lot um, when you didn't see anybody immediately um, around you, but there are always somebody poking their heads out. Physical space is negotiated not only physically, but also sonically. How their sounds resonate with the physical environment that they walk through is of prime importance. The acoustic of, uh, acoustics of each site, dirt road as opposed to concrete buildings, echoey residential area as opposed to crowded and loud train stations, affects their performance choices. Takayoshi, a thinly built friendly member that's been with the troupe for about 27 years, added how the temperature and weather influenced their sound. He said, quote, it's about whether uh, you can let your sound resonate far through the air. When it's hot and humid or rainy, the sound of kane feels heavy, for example, end quote. This highlights how architecture and the built environment, walls, streets, buildings, and the atmosphere have an active role in the production of hibiki. Imaginative empathy guides them to improvise their performance accordingly, determining where to go, how long to stay in one place, where to take a break, what to play and how. And they all often talk about how much uh, they get done while they're on break as when they're actually walking because people find them more approachable when they're just smoking and standing by. Except for starting and ending the day in front of the store of their employers, the routes and schedules are never predetermined. The itinerary is impromptu, always decided on the spot. Choices of repertoire, dynamics, timbre, duration, location, costume, size of the troupe are all decided based on how to best how best to resonate with the sentiments of the audience. So now I want to um, play a, a few tracks to kind of highlight how you might be able to listen for these um, strategic differences. Um, so the first track is, was recorded um, at a, a summer festival in Menuma, which is sort of in the outskirt of Saitama Ken. And uh, this was a Chindonya troupe, all female troupe, actually, um, that was hired by the town's association to kind of bring liveliness to the festival. And this is what they sounded like. <laughs> ending that. You heard um, multiple chindon drums, multiple um, kanes, so you heard multiple percussionists banging pretty liberally. Um, they, they didn't have to be worried too much about their volume because the, the um, environment was pretty loud already because it's at a festival. There were also multiple instrumental players um, playing in unison an enka tune because that was appealing to the demographic of the audience, which was sort of in their 50s, 60s, 70s, um, people who would like the sentiment, sentimental popular uh, music genre of enka. Uh, in contrasting that to this track, which was uh, recorded one afternoon in a quiet residential area around 3 p.m. <laughs> of 
probably many of you know what the song is, uh, but this is Ampam Man, right? The theme song from a beloved children's cartoon. Um, and you notice that compared to the first track, it's very sparse. So the, the, they don't, this is a very resonant environment uh, with concrete walls. So they try not to be too loud uh, so as not to bother the, the neighbors. So they don't bang too much on the drum especially. Um, and they chose that cartoon theme song because they knew they were about to turn a corner towards a kindergarten where moms will be biking to pick up the children. So if they can get the children's attention, then they can stop the moms and then they can pitch whatever they're trying to sell that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, briefly, I want to introduce you to a couple of sort of uh, aesthetic principles that I found uh, pretty uh, fascinating. So one is the aesthetics of anti-individualism. Referring to the importance of improvisatory skills and sensitivity to respond to and, uh, and reflect settings and atmosphere, Hayashi likened the chindonya to other performance practices, pra practices such as um, live accompaniment to silent film or jazz. He said, uh, is Chindonya a self-expression? Maybe, but not really. It's more like film music. Adapting to each landscape and atmosphere, we think of what kinds of sound would touch people's hearts. Like a jazz improvisation session, what you play is based on what bubbles up in the spot. Echoing his assertion, ta ta uh, Takada Yosuke in Tokyo, uh, another Chindonya said, matter of factly, that Chindonya is not a form of self-expression. Um, no hyogen janai. Uh, and Okuma Wataru, sitting next to him, nodded enthusiastically. Deflection of the practitioner's expressive agency was a repeated theme in many conversations I had with Chindonya practitioners across Japan. The point is not to be heard as an autonomous self. It's not even necessary to be heard at all. In fact, Hayashi described the ethics of sounding as a Chindonya by stating that the sales pitch must sound in a way that it's OK if it's heard or not heard. Their cavalier mindset to speak and sound in a way such that it doesn't matter whether they are listened to at all is at odds with the, same, uh, the sense of individual agency central to the notion of a liberal subject. The sonic philosophies behind the production of Hibiki instead imply an anti-individualistic aesthetics and relational concept of uh, conception of sociality that extends to one's surroundings and climate. And then another sort of aesthetic that I found interesting uh, is what I call cultivated imperfection. While choosing an appropriate tune that will appeal to the targeted, genera uh, uh, targeted generation or audience is a crucial skill in sounding imaginative empathy, Chindonya practitioners' focus is never on developing a vast repertoire or acquiring mastery in performance skill. In fact, a virtuosic performance is considered uh, cons consciously avoided. On numerous occasions, members of Chindon Tsushinja have shared with me their trick of intentionally making mistakes. Impressing the audience with an awe-inspiring performance is counterproductive. It would reproduce uh, the conventional audience performer framework within which audience passively observes and is often expected to pay the performers. By deliberately sounding amateurish or by mispronouncing the names of local businesses and schools in their speeches, Chindonya performers are hoping to make themselves more approachable. The cultivated imperfection in turn invites audience interaction. Passers-by laugh at their mistakes, some even come up to correct them. Many choose to stay and listen instead of hurriedly walking away to avoid the expectation of payment after the performance. The lack of direct financial trans transaction between Chindonya and potential customers and the intentionally humorous and, quote, irresponsible performance style invite listeners to engage in social relations in which they did not expect to, to participate. Kobayashi also told me, the clarinet player, that while choosing a tune to appeal to a particular generation can be an effective tool for reaching a, a, the audience, he doesn't always prioritize song selection. And um, this kind of came about when um, this happened during the field work. Bee Gees staying alive, if you didn't get that. 
So this is, while this is widely popular here, it's not the most recognizable tune among urban um, passersby in Japan, particularly in this neighborhood. So I went to, uh, up to him during the break and asked, did I just hear Staying Alive? And he actually played uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire September after this, back to back. Um, and Kobayashi smiled and said, well, I thought I'd play a game to see if you'd recognize those tunes. Good year. This was a striking moment. Not only was he playing for his own enjoyment, but also gestured towards me, the ethnographer who constantly followed him around. I consider this a testament to his skill in the art of deepening relationship with listeners, both imagined and abstract audiences and specific individual listeners on site. Kobayashi was able to do this without risking the loss of the audience because in his words, quote, it actually doesn't really matter all that much what you play, it's more important to make good sound as long as the sound blends well with the sound of the chindon drums and kane. Referring to this emphasis on the sound over a tune or virtuosity, Kawas uh, Kawaguchi also said, you don't have to put on a good performance, but you have to make good sound. What then is a good sound that, produce, uh, that produces effective resonances in their advertisement enterprise? Why do chindonya sounds in particular have such immediate and enticing effect on the listeners? Linguistic uh, specificity might reveal certain ways of listening to chindonya sounds. When chindonya sounds are described in conversations, one always uses the verb kikoeru, an inflection of the verb kiku, to hear or to listen. Although one usually uses the standard form of the verb kiku to describe listening with intention, such as to an iPod or concert performance, it's extremely rare, if not awkward, to use the same verb for chindonya. Instead, one uses the passive conjugation kikoeru. The direct translation would be chindonya sounds can be heard. In addition, once inflected passively, a sense of spatiality emerges. With it, while kiku is simply listening, kikoeru carries a sense of overhearing. Without the intentional focused activity of listening, sounds are carried over space and pouring into one, one's ears. One does not listen to chindonya sounds, one overhears chindonya sounds. To perform as to entice listeners and marshal their att attention involves sounding in ways that promotes this way of peripheral listening. One does not need to intentionally listen to be touched by the sounds of Im imaginative empathy. The notion of touching a listener, a physical metaphor for the effect of sounds on one's affect, shows how sound can be a significant dimension through which a sense of public intimacy can be produced. This attention to sound's ability to reach across physical boundaries and elicit embodied sociality across distance underscores Chindonya's sound business to be overheard. Now with uh, what I discussed uh, thus far in mind, I return to the question at the beginning. What kinds of understanding of public space and listening public emerge from their practices? When Chindonya practitioners uh, pra successfully, successfully elicited joy or contentment in the listeners, I often heard the bystanders, bystanders saying, Genki wo moratta, they gave me spirit, good spirit, or they lifted me up. This is no simple cheerleading task according to Hayashi. He offered a lengthy comment elaborating on the way he perceived sound, space, listeners, their sentiments, and his role in reaching out to them. And it's quite long, but um, it, I think it's quite important, so I will read it out. Um, After all, I'm playing to the people at home. It took me 20 years to realize that. I'm playing to make them want to come outside. I look at the atmosphere of the town and income to understand who is at home during the day on a weekday. Happy, healthy people are out at work. Those who are home are the sick, housewives, unemployed, physically disadvantaged, the elderly, grandchildren. It's rare to find a happy full-time housewife. Heavy work and the husband is busy and rarely home. They'd be doing laundry sadly. So we take them outside and make them feel like something good could happen. It's like a mental hospital of the town. It's rare to find happy people around here. In quiet residential areas, you can hear small sounds. So if you play loudly, they won't come out. You have to play with sensitivity and delicacy. Otherwise, you'll be annoying them. If, um, if they're depressed, they won't come out to happy loud sounds. We have to make sounds that would make the depressed want to come out." End quote. Here I know Chindonya practitioners' sensitivity to geographically delineated differences produced in the register of gender, class, physical ability, and age. Imaginative empathy allows Chindonya to make visible an audience, those who, um, an, uh, an audible, those who make visible and audible, those who are excluded from the production forces of the economy and bounded within the physical confines of walls and segregated neighborhoods. Chindonya practitioners' creative and empathetic sounds bleed over such delineating lines, 
reaching across the physical boundaries in hopes that their resonances might invite them outside of their rooms to the veranda or to the streets to forge new social relations with Chimdonya among themselves and with, with the local commerce. Streets, often assumed to be the abstract space of social anonymity, become a site of social warmth when home is considered a place of isolation. Hibiki created through Chindonya sonic practices, therefore, make audible social differences that are often drowned in noises, hidden behind walls, or marginalized from the labor force. Put another way, the acoustic and affective permeability of Chindonya resonances allows us to listen to the politics of exclusion in contemporary Japanese urban life. Um, and I had a quick example uh, of them being employed by NTT, a corporate company in Kamagasaki, which is uh, a day laborer's town, but for the interest of time, I will skip that. Um, and I can talk about it if you like during Q&A. Um, however, the question arises, what is the cost of selling their smiles? While Chindoya sounds do the cultural work of creating sociality through drawing people into unexpected social relations spanning class, ethnic, and territorial boundaries, the fact that Chindonya ultimately seeks profit puts Chindonya is an, is in an ambiguous position. Just like the inherent tension of Chindonya mentioned by Hayashi at the beginning of the talk, Chindonya's relationship oscillates between the marginalized population, to whom they appeal through imaginative empathy, and the very market force that alienates people like the day laborers um, in the first place. This seeming paradox is precisely what propels the increasing demand for affective labor in the post-industrial economy, in which reification of sociality is the name of the game. But it would be hasty to consider Chindonya as simply being co-opted by, or opportunistically valorizing, the logic of neoliberal capitalism. Chindonya's persistent commit to commitment to the acoustic and affective production of sociality, inali inali inalienable and embodied presences improvised at every encounter, resist the terms of capital. And their distinctly relational and anti-individualistic aesthetic principles run against the assumptions of the liberal subject central to the current arrangement of capital. The linguist par linguistic particularity about the ways in which listeners are socialized to overhear Chindonya sound may offer a clue here. Just as their overheard sound can become part of the listener's soundscape and awareness without necessarily actively taking part, I suggest that Chindonya is riding the wave of the increasing demand for affective labor without necessarily taking part in the logic of the neoliberal present. Much, is, much in the same way as Chindonya has internalized multiple histories and logics of time, vernacular histories of social marginalization, shifting modes of sociality, sociality through different capitalisms, and narratives of European and Japanese capitalist modernities, which I discuss in chapters one and two. Chindonya's Hibiki simultaneously works within multiple spatialities and modes of production within the neoliberal economy and outside the logic of capital. Without accounting for or being accounted for by any single structural logic, Chindonya gathers and articulates relations, histories, and forces by attending to the contingencies that inform the present moment. There, Hibiki resonates across the dynamically produced space latent with open-ended potentialities that are circulating both public publicly and through intimate everyday lives. So to conclude, ethnographically attending to the historical and cultural particularities of Chindonya through the analytical lens of Hibiki has led me to hear the various kinds of work perform performed by this seemingly innocuous, anachronistic, and allegedly apolitical practice. The resonance of Chindonya complicates the so-called Western narrative of capital by suggesting the simultaneity of different histories of capital in the present moment. It unsettles the liberal conception of the subject by foregrounding a relational understanding of sociality. And it de denaturalizes the absolute assumptions of public space, absolutist assumptions of public space that foreclosed po political possibilities in the previous modes of street protests in Japan. Chindonya, imbued with traces of old itinerant performing arts, redolent of the modern nostalgia for the uncommodified, and operating as an entrepreneurial business made viable again in the contemporary market, continues to entice those who overhear them today. Neither music or noise, street performance nor street vendor, traditional nor modern, Chindonya persists amidst, amidst contradictions inherent in the neoliberal present. Chindonya is rooted in capitalist modernity and yet is a critique of it through embodying deviant traces of the pre-capitalist past. 
Chindonia valorizes the neoliberal abstraction of sociality through their affective labor, while doggedly maintaining a humanistic commitment to creating social encounters irreducible to capital. Through Chindonia is, though Chindonia is considered out of time, its resonances reveal how its presumed obsolescence is part of the temporal heterogeneity that constitutes the present moment. Despite a prevalent public, prevalent public perception of Chindonia as out of place, Chindonia has always had its place as an integral part of the affective scenery of the streetscape, precisely through its difference, producing space, as Henri Lefebvre would have it, as they articulate social relations, histories, and imaginaries through their soundings. The relevance and appeal of Chindonia today, however small and seemingly outdated, emerge from these tensions and dynamics that Chindonia embrace with a nonchalant smile and a playful skip. Thank you. So sorry for going a little bit over time, but I'm happy to take comments, suggestions, Are advice. You At the beginning of your lecture, you show the uh, chapter of from your book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, after the epilogue, you said affordance of something, something, right? Yeah. The idea of the affordance come from the uh, that environmental psychology affordance? No, I'm uh, thinking about Deleuze. Huh? Deleuze and Gattari. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I should read up on that. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering about, uh, you alluded to the affective labor and um, <coughs> that, that the performers are doing. I was wondering if they feel uh, especially tired because of the emotional aspects of their labor and their performance as well, right? So we think about like the classic works on affective labor is that, for instance, being a stewardess or an air hostess or whatever we call them now, um <coughs> brings, when you have to pretend to be happy while you work, um, it's a, it, brings a different kind of exhaustion, um, and it's, it feels like a different kind of labor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I understand, I'm not in performance studies, but I imagine that as a performer, that's a, a relatively kind of standard emotional exhaustion or feeling, something like that. I don't know if you're exhausted or you're high, you know, feeling mm -hmm. good after a performance. But I was wondering if, if I can imagine walking through a town and thinking about trying to play music guessing about what kind of music depressed people would like could be really exhausting mm -hmm. um, at a different level. And I was wondering if people think or talk about that. Thank you for that question. Um, so from just uh, my ethnographic recollections, I haven't heard them complain about their exhaustion. Um, and then I think that might be, and this is my interpretation, um, that might come from the fact that they don't necessarily think of it as their, their um, that's not their understanding of their labor, right? I'm sort of understanding how what they do does fit into what has become the ep epitome of this current late capitalist uh, arrangement of labor. But um, for them, they uh, simply understand what they are doing as sort of the, the carryover, right, of this um, itinerant performance arts from the pre-capitalist Japan. Um, and I think that consciousness um, and their, that approach uh, seems to sort of make everything matter of fact. Um, for example, when they performed, they, they were requested to perform in the disaster affected areas um, after 3-11. And just seeing, and it was right after, um, and Actually, when we were up there, there was still a uh, magnitude five aftershock, so it was really fresh. Um, but even in front of this sort of you know unspeakable loss and, and devastation, they sort of said, I, "I asked, like, so that must have been difficult to to play for the, in this situation." And they said, "Business as usual. It's it's what you do. It, and there's no difference." So there is some sort of matter of fact um, uh, internalization, I think, of just. Uh, listening that way and sort of positioning relationally um, themselves to others through sound um, that seems to kind of make them 
not too vulnerable, I think, to that sense of exhaustion. Um, I can't really explain more than that, um, but thank you. I, I will think more about that. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have two questions, if I may. Um, first is, I got the impression that it was mostly small businesses who hired these folks, but then you mentioned NPT. So uh, could you elaborate a little bit more who um, hires these folks? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, you know, how long do these people um, stay in a particular place when they're, they're going on a uh, mission, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Do they just, you know, move around and continuously move, or do they stop and play and then call? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with the, the second. Um, it, they always mix up the, f uh, the uh, moving around, what they call um, nagashi, like a letting flow, and then staying in one place, which is, which is itsuki, sort of sticking to one place. They mix that up. So they normally walk for a little bit, and then at strategic spots, they might stay for up to several minutes, but no longer than that. Um, uh, because they don't, they're not really supposed to stay in one place, right? Um, there is, there are law, laws, um, so they're not really subject to that. They have, they've never been, in my experience of following them around, they've never been busted by the police. But they also don't put the permit. There's, there's some sort of uh, in, uh, informal arrangement where if they uh, apply for a permit, then the police would be liable if uh, an accident or trouble happens. Um, so they don't do that, um, but instead they try not to stay in one place for too long t so as not to, to obstruct uh, traffic or cause nuisance for other people. Um, and then for uh, their clients, uh, so yes, it ranges from a mom and pop butcher shop to NTT, um, and increasingly so, I think more and more larger corporate companies also have employed them. Um, also, you know, like the, the city of Osaka has uh, hired them to promote the election, like, you know, telling people to go and vote. So really different kinds of entities um, have hired them, but the, the intentions behind them, I think, are quite interesting, especially for the corporate companies and shops. So they don't do it necessarily to expect direct results in numbers. They have sort of different investments. Um, for example, when a new barber shop opened in a sort of a street, shopping street, then they hire them to bring liveliness for the larger community of the shop association, not just to themselves. So it was sort of a, a way of a gifting uh, and doing their part to be part of the community so they can, they can be a tool for uh, fostering relations between the businesses. Also, pachinko slot machine parlors have always been uh, the pr uh, a, a huge client of Chindonya business, and uh, part of it is to make a facade because ch pachinko slot machine parlors can sometimes be associated with yakuza and underground economies. Um, not all the the local residents have the best impression, so by hiring Chindonya, um, it can kind of put on a facade of a friendly. Um, business in the community. So uh, there are different ways in which these different businesses choose to hire Chindonya, but yeah, it can vary in sizes. Thank you, this was uh, fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about who those people are. Um, they seem to have um, some great capacity to eloquently speak about the meanings of their, their work. And uh, I was struck by that. And also at the same time being quite condescending to people who stay at home in the daytime on the week weekdays. Um, so are they, they, they seem to um, think, I was thinking of what the equivalent might be in the United States. And they, uh, they seem to think of themselves more like, uh, I don't know, Disney World uh, mm -hmm. parade performers than Times Square Elmo kind of, right, uh, people. So um, do they get some kind of training? Um, I'm sure they get some kind of musical training, but are they, and most of them are, um, have this as full-time job, right? Mm -hmm. like, es especially at this Chindon to Shinsha. But some, th some of them seem quite young. So are they in transition from right, uh, uh, musical school, but couldn't find a job and doing this, and then go to somewhere else? Or wh what are the 
career trajectory of those mm-hmm. people and the kind of background, also class and mm-hmm. whatever ethnic, ethnic background of those people. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So um, they are. So there's. Um, I wasn't able to get into this, but there was a blank period in the Chindonya history. Um, they've been around for a while, and then s- uh, from really the the economic depression um, and into. Uh, and especially in 1989 when the emperor passed away and all the sort of public display of festivity and commercial commercialism were discouraged. That really was a big hit um, in, on the Chindonya business. So there was a, like a 10 year, 10 to 15 year period when Chindonya really almost uh, disappeared. Not many two new people were uh, coming in. Um, and then in the late 80s, uh, these, the, the three main members of Chindonya troop here in Osaka and also one person in Tokyo almost simultaneously um, sort of found Chindonya to be a, a source of in, uh, inspiration aesthetically and economically. And they started to apprentice with the previous generation. So what, what you're seeing really is sort of a new generation that are equally invested in doing the business um, and also, um, as much as learning and doing this kind of archival work, working with the previous generation. Um, and so, to that extent, these people really do come from a bit of an, uh, a distance. They, they don't necessarily share the same class, ethnic background of the previous generations, uh, which were of a uh, fairly low socioeconomic background. Uh, uh, some of them did have connections to um, Buraku people, not many, um, not many Korean Japanese people participated, but really close associate uh, connections with the Korean businesses in Osaka, right? So there were um, those uh, connections, but this current generation, uh, this generation and the ones after, um, I would say they come from a fairly um, like lower uh, middle class to working class uh, background. Some of them have uh, university degrees in businesses. Um, but, and, and these people did meet at Ritsumeikan Daigaku, but they all quit in the middle and they <laughs> turned this into their, their full time job. Um, I, uh, so I would say that they don't necessarily share the historical background of Chindonya practitioners, but um, yeah. Uh, but they don't necessarily mean those comments uh, with a condescending uh, sentiment. Um, I didn't mean to read it in that way. They uh, very much sort of um, empathize or sort of a um, ally, I think, with those who their sounds reach. Um, partly because by by practice practicing this business, they don't live that well, right? <laughs> this isn't really a huge income. The million dollar uh, in annual income was uh, a statistics of the past, and especially after 3.11, um, some of them were forced to take on multiple part-time jobs. So they're, you know, they are sort of making their ends meet on a day-to-day basis. But um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the, the types of people. <coughs> Musical training, they don't usually have beforehand. And they get into the troupe and then they get their training by doing. Um, there was a one clarinet player in this troupe that decided to join the troupe because they wanted, he wanted to learn how to play the clarinet, but he didn't have the instrument and he couldn't afford the studio fees where he can um, practice. But by doing this, he's given the instrument and he can just play in the public space. So people come in with different um, aspirations. Yes, sorry. Do they employ a public relations agent or uh, agency to help them uh, find work and relate to business? No, they. I mean, they are the public, right? Relations, <laughs> per, uh, business. So. Uh, Do they form a guild. Uh, no, but not not officially. Um, but they, uh, there is an annual festival or sort of contest in Toyama City where all the, the Chindonya troops across Japan gather together and comp- quote unquote compete. Um, and that's been going on since the 1940, 
no, I think 49 or 50. Um, so that became an occasion where uh, all these uh, Chindonya troops gather and get to know each other, and there's a sense of solidarity, and sometimes they help each other when they need more extra uh, troop members, then they can help each other out. But there isn't really a, a official sense of guild like other um, Edo period guilds. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to say because there are many amateurish troops, um, but I would say somewhere between 15 and 20 now, but not all of them are full-time and active. I would say several that are at this level. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, again, thanks for your talk. Uh, that was um, very enlightening. Uh, in the last part, when you talk about the uh, aesthetics of uh, anti-individualism and uh, those paradox uh, uh, within the uh, performance, uh, or uh, should I say, sound uh, more precisely, um, I, I was wondering, like, how can we like make of this sort of uh, paradox of the uh, the hi historical a and the presence um, with the the previous um, concept you you mentioned the hibiki the uh, resonance uh, under that uh, overarching framework. So I was kind of because um, I I see like more specifically I I see the uh, instruments uh, they are holding are uh, varied in kinds. Like some of them uh, use uh, clarinets, some of them use more like uh, uh, wooden drums. Uh, so it's a mixture of uh, uh, west, west and mm -hmm. the east uh, sort of cultural thing. And uh, how can I like interpret that into a uh, discourse of time and space? I think you are almost uh, paraphrasing one of my main points already that <laughs> I think uh, Hibiki allows us to see that those things aren't necessarily in opposition, right? There wasn't this linear progression from the tradition to the m to modernity or from east to the west, but in fact, as you can see in the material culture of the instrumentation, um, these different uh, historicities actually are right here, right now, in the present moment. Um, and I think they're, they have a very curious, creative, and historicizing uh, almost obsession in how uh, sort of pre pre modern practices were, and how people moved, how moved, uh, how people walked, how people played, how people listened, um, and by doing that kind of work and embodying them in the present moment, I think they're sort of stirring up um, some of these historical, um, you know, quote unquote traditional uh, values as actually part of the present moment. They're they're you know sort of that multiple modernities. Um, argument, I think. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So one last question. Um, yeah. Thanks, Marie, for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of uh, cultural affectation um, and a kind of huge resonance, um, each one of each uh, troop, uh, what is the kind of degree of uh, affinity? Um, are they, you know, if they're going to have more uh, atomistic affect, you know, for an infant group? Um, so the the distance traveled in relation to. So how often do they play and how far do they grow? In relation to the the community, the neighborhoods. Yes. Okay. Um, during the busy seasons, this trip has you know twenty people. Um, each each gig requires three to five people. So sometimes multiple troops are dispatched to different areas of Osaka. Um, and that can happen every day. Um, but there can't be sort of a slow period, like right now it's a slow period, right after the New Year's festivities. Uh, they don't always have gigs. Um, so it's kind of hard to say how often uh, they go, but in Osaka, uh, a lot of people do see Chindonya. I think Chindonya has become uh, a thing of the past um, for a while now, but especially I think young people today, they don't get to see the real ones, especially in Tokyo very often. So when I gave lectures in, in Tokyo, I would say in a large university lecture room, there are only two or three people who've seen 
chindonya in Tokyo, but it's different in Osaka because these people were pretty high in demand and they can dispatch multiple troops. Um, they are, I think, a little bit more integrated into the everyday soundscapes um, of Osaka. And they walk eight hours, six to eight hours a day, right? At a very slow tempo like this, but they can go average of eight to 10 kilometers um, and they, they can really zigzag through, but th strategically in relation to whatever the client um, business is location. So they don't really go too far, um, but they know what the, where um, the rhythms of the daily routines of the people and kind of where people cluster at different times. You know, if it's a business area, then they tend to go to the lunch areas right around lunchtime so they can talk to the office workers um, and things like that. So does that yes. answer your question? Yes. So maybe so uh, our next project. Wait, excuse me. Oh, cantina. <laughs> yeah, but that's a bar well, band, I right? I, <laughs> I love Star Wars. Oh, I was yeah, in. So. I'm sorry to cut this short, uh, but, uh, yeah, sure. but, but we're going to. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. So, so we're going to end it there. Um, join me and join me in welcoming and thanking <laughs> Professor Marie Abe very much. Thank you. Thank you.